Okay. Questions? Questions about the assignment, about anything else? Okay, so last time um, we looked at more at interfaces. We went and defined uh, certain graphical types like point, Cartesian point, polar point, uh, line, and we saw that if those points, uh, if those objects follow certain uh, certain rules about the, about the annotations they use and the properties they have, then uh, object editor can go and display them as graphics. Okay? So a point would be shown as a point on the screen and a line as a line and so forth. And um, any, any, again, any questions on that stuff? You'll get more practice with this stuff uh, on, uh, on Friday. Okay. So the topic now, as this title says, is object and shape composition. And of course, we use the word composition in English. So anybody want to uh, guess what I might mean by um, object composition? So you have, yeah. So t taking several lines as an example and creating some other object that consists of those lines? A square or a rectangle or maybe an avatar, right? Excellent. So in English we say, you know, or even in music, we talk of composition. And that really means putting smaller things into, uh, typically it means creating something artistic or something creative uh, from smaller components. So we don't compose letters into words. Words are sort of, you know, just sort of the atomic value. But we compose words into uh, sentences. Sentences are, are, are composed into paragraphs and so forth. Okay? So we do that a lot, and that's the art of writing. And the art of programming, at least in the, even in non-object-oriented world, will be composing values into other values, okay? And the values in the case of object-oriented programming happen to be primarily objects, okay? Those are the more interesting values. And we'll compose objects into bigger objects, which can be composed further into objects and so forth, okay? So that's what we look at today. And uh, um, as, I, as I've alluded, that there's a notion of creating from smaller things, bigger things, so then we can talk of structure, okay? So we can talk of sentences having a structure, paragraphs having a structure, so we can even talk of objects having structures, okay? And then, as we'll see, there's actually two ways to figure out what, what structure really means. So let's uh, just uh, recall something we learned earlier. We divided, uh, so of course we have different kinds of types. We have double, int, um, string and so forth. Because each of them is a different type. And we can classify these types into categories also. Okay? And we can classify them in many ways. And this is one way we saw earlier, that uh, the types can be, con can be uh, divided into primitive types and object types. Okay? And, and what's an object type? What's the, what's the distinction between an object type and a, a primitive type? So we know a type is yes. The value itself. So from just from purely a storage point of view, excellent. You know, an object type, um, its its value is associated with a pointer, and that pointer is stored in the variable of that type. A primitive value is stored with just a va associated with just a value. It also has a pointer, but that pointer is kept hidden, and it's not directly put in the variable. The variable holds the value. Okay, so that's 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 one distinction from just a storage point of view. And how we, and, and any other way to say what's an what's an object uh, to uh, to differentiate between the two? You can, you can say that given an object type, that's what the, what's, what, what the storage manager does. Okay, that it goes and stores either a pointer or a value. 
So we have to first figure out whether it's an object type or not an object type. And if you didn't know all the details about memory, if you just knew other things like how to program, how could you tell whether, whether you know, so why is a BMI calc, why is a BMI spreadsheet an object type and double not an object type? Yeah. Because you instantiate it. Because you instantiate it. Because BMI calculator is a class. Okay. So that's why any class is an object type. And are all object types classes? We see in this picture that BMI spreadsheet, the interface, is also an object type. Okay? So basically an object is an instance of a class. Any type describing an object is an object type. Okay? And internally how it's stored, you know, you could go either way actually. It just so happens that it's convenient and efficient in many ways to do it the way we did it. Okay? So basically, Object types are class types and interface types, okay? And any other type is a primitive type, okay? So if we've created a class like a BMI spreadsheet, if we've created an interface like a BMI, small, uh, like a BMI spreadsheet versus BMI spreadsheet, we know these are object types. If you were to use somebody else's type like string, how do you know that it's an object type? So string is somebody else's type, int is somebody else's type. How do we know? Uh, how do we really know? Well, we can go look at the code, but is there some convention we know? Object types start with capital. Okay, that's why the convention exists, so that we know. We know that they'll be stored differently. We know they'll have different behavior. So let's go and make that apparent. Let's not have to comment each time and say this is an object type. Let's just go and start the name with a capital. Letter. Okay? So that's, so that's a distinction. And um, questions on this? You'll be doing a lot of classification today uh, of types. Okay, and this is, this is the primary classification you have to know uh, to even understand how you're programming. Okay, and indeed, object types are referenced by uh, pointers and primitive types are referenced by value. Okay. And again, these are both types. You might say, you know, what's the distinction between, what's the similarity between a double, small, you know, this, this primitive type and this class? They just are very different things. I can take a number and say number plus number. I can say number minus number. Okay, and that's how I go and deal with, 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 with these numbers. Whereas when I have to do, have a, when I have classes and then I have to go and say object dot method name, um, class dot method name. So you might go and think that, uh, you know, they're just very different things. But in fact, at an abstract sense, they're all defining what operations you can execute uh, on the values of these types. Okay. So you can take it. You can take two ints and add to them each. Add to uh, add them to each other. You can't take two booleans, which are also happen to be primitive types, and add them to each other. Okay. And the fact that you can't do add for booleans and the, and you can do them for int is what distinguishes these two types. Okay. So in general, all of these types you can use create a variable of that type. So that's you know that's that's common to all of these types. But what do you do with the variable afterwards depends on the exact type. If it's string, you can do carat. Okay. If it's a BMI spreadsheet, you can do get BMI. And if it is an int, you can add, add two numbers. So basically, a type is a set of operations. What we do in programming is just execute operations. And what operations we can do depends on the type of the value. Okay. So that's what's really going on here uh, when, we, when we type. Okay. And when we go in, in every language, there are types, some force variables to have types when they're declared so that you, you don't do anything wrong. Okay, and some say, okay, we, we trust you won't do anything wrong, so we won't make you go and specify the type of each variable. But if you do something wrong at runtime, we'll give you an exception. And, and so there's different philosophies. We want to do quick programming, and if you're a pretty good programmer or a careful programmer, um, then maybe you use, you know, you don't have variables explicitly typed, otherwise you do. Okay? So what we've done here involves both an object type and primitive types. The object type is line. That's what we're creating here. And we're creating this line type from primitive types. Okay? We have this int here, this int, we have ints all over. And we are in fact creating, you know, this type by defining some methods that involve int values, either as return values or as parameters. And of course, now that we know the bean conventions, we know that this type consists of four properties 
each of which is of type int. Okay? So we've composed an object type from primitive types. Okay? So we've done some composition. Okay? And we've created a new type from these small types. Okay? And that's the kind of composition you've done so far when you created your token classes, when you created your scanner B. Well, not quite scanner B. Uh, well, not even token, actually. I'll take that back. What we've seen in class has all been involved um, composing primitive types. Now, can you, um, and the reason I said the scanner bean is not created from primitive types is because the property of a scanner bean is, which is, we saw earlier, starts with a capital S. We, we don't know. This is, comes automatically, but it starts with the capital S, so it must be an object type. Okay, that's why, uh, that, and, and so, and even your tokens have string properties. So, uh, okay. Okay. Now, can you, and, and when we looked at line, we saw that we can represent a line in many ways, okay? We could have the upper left corner and the bounding box. The, uh, we could have a bounding box and define the upper left corner of the bounding box and the width and height of the bounding box. Somebody else said, look, I can take the upper left corner and the lower right corner of the, of the bounding box and define the line that way. And there's lots of ways to do it. Now, let's think of a way in which we would be composing the line not from primitive values, but from at least one object value. So we could decompose a line into, right now we're decomposing the line into four primitives. Can you imagine uh, 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 a way in which the line could be decomposed into an object, which is then decomposed into smaller values? That would mean taking those four properties, yeah. Excellent. Rather than having four primitive values, I could have two object values, each of which is further decomposed into two values. We already have point from before, so this is nice. I took primitive values, composed them into point, I composed point into line. Okay? And that's, that's getting rid of all four, and what I'm going to do is uh, use another... another um, uh, Another way which, which object editor can understand. Okay? So object editor always wants a bounding box, height and width for sure. And, and that is int values. And, um, and we're going to have now a location for the upper left corner. And that location will be of type point. Okay? Which means the getter will return that value. And the setter will take a value. Uh, will take uh, some, a point rather than uh, the x and y. Okay? So, my line with object property. Okay, so we've seen now, for the first time in class at least, uh, composing uh, objects into other objects. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so this... So, we'll say an object that has um, at least one object property as a composite object. Okay? So line, the original line is not a composite object. It had only uh, primitive values. This, it's, a, it's, a, it's a structured object, but not a composite object. Whereas a composite object, we'll say, as an object that has at least one object. Okay, I'm not sure it's the best term for it, but I can't think of another term for it. Okay? Okay, so now here's my implementation of that particular interface. Okay, and where I was taking had a constructor with two primitive values de describing the coordinates. Now I have a constructor that takes uh, a point value. And then, of course, I have, I have a variable now also of type point rather than a variable of type, uh, rather than two variables. Okay? And then, of course, my, uh, my, and I also added another constructor that takes nothing. And, of course, then my getters and setters follow the rules we've seen before. Okay? They basically just read and write the variables. Okay? And what's interesting here is that we have both uh, uh, an object type here and a primitive type here. And in, in the implementation we saw earlier, we had only two object types, and that would be also valid. Object editor wouldn't quite understand that, uh, just, uh, but it will understand this one. Okay? <coughs> There's lots of valid representations that object editor doesn't understand, and these are two ones that it does. Okay? 
So let's look at this graphically. If uh, I mentioned last time that we, we can display an object using a tree window, and the tree window will show you uh, all, the, all the properties of the object. And we see here hierarchically, we see that this is now not a flat hierarchy, but this is, there's a nesting here that you have two primitive values, and then we have this location, which can be further broken up into multiple values, okay, and multiple properties. And so we have this point property, we have this int property, okay, and we can see visually that the point property looks different from the int property, okay, and, and that's partly because point is object and int is primitive, okay. So like I said, I can take the types in this world and classify them into primitive types and object types. Can you imagine other ways of classifying uh, those, these types also based on just this example? So a point is an object type, an int is a primitive type. Can you s say there's some other differences also between these two types in the abstract? So primitive means that there's a predefined, that there's no class or interface behind it. Object means there's a class or interface behind it. So that's sort of one thing. Now this, uh, any other terms you guys might have studied before of classifying types? Okay, so int was pro provided by who? A point was defined by who? Us. We are programmers. So we would call it what kind of type perhaps? You might have heard this term. Or invent one. So programmer defined type. And what would be the opposite of programmer defined? Just from English? Predefined. Okay? So int is a predefined type. And object is a programmer defined type. Are all uh, object types, types programmer defined? No. And what's an example of one that isn't? String. Okay? So that's another way of classifying things. Okay, now this value is much bigger, it's decomposable. This value is not decomposable. So what might, terms might you use for decomposable and non-decomposable? Just from your English language, I mean, just if you would invent something. So what in, in chemistry or physics, what, something that's not decomposable is called? Atomic. So maybe structured in atomic? Okay. So, so Let's go and look at this in more depth. So we have programmer defined versus predefined. Okay, we have, we have primitive versus object. But now my string, which used to be in my uh, object type, has now gone into my predefined type. All my primitive types are predefined, but some object types also happen to be predefined. Okay? And some of these predefined types are part of the java.lang package, which means you don't have to import them. Other types like object editor, the annotations you're looking at, array list, if you've, see, you've seen it before or when we see it later, these are all examples of types that are not on java.lang and those you have to import. Okay. Okay. And then we have, uh, so programmer defined types uh, are basically uh, ones that are defined by, by, by not the language and the, sta the standard language of the libraries. Okay? And as I say here, all primitive types are predefined. Okay? And structure versus atomic. Now that's going to be a little trickier to define. Okay? We're going to spend a bit of time here. So uh, I put uh, I put uh, a BMI spreadsheet as a structure type. And you guys remember, we just looked at this very cursorily, the BMI calculator type. Do you guys remember what, remember what it did? It just had a calculate BMI method. It had no properties. Okay? It had no variables in it too. So I put that as an atomic type 
and I put the other ones as structure types. So how might you define, uh, you know, we saw by example and by visually we saw that, you know, that, that, that picture was, you know, was, was showed some decomposition. So the question becomes, when we, uh, so clearly a structure type is something that has, that can be decomposed, that has some child, that has some, uh, the, 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 where an object has some child into which it can be decomposed. So what exactly is the child of an object? Yeah. Property. A property. Any other definition possible? Based on what we said earlier, exactly that. That's good. Good. I'm glad you're thinking in terms of properties. But if, uh, well, anybody? So if I look at how it's stored in memory, how might I decompose the object? So an object storage and memory consists of what? Is defined by its properties or its variables? Okay. So you can either look at the variables or you look at the properties. Okay. And I and which one we use? Well, we'll just say there's two kinds of structures. There's a physical structure, which is the variable decomposition, and what will be the opposite of physical? This is a term you'll computer scientists love to use. When it's not physical, it's so variables is physical, and uh, what would be a good antonym for physical? Yeah, Abs that's a very logical answer. <laughs> yes, logical. Have you heard that before, or did you just derive it? You've heard it before. I wonder about these computer science terms we use, whether they really make sense or not. So. Okay. So instances of structure type decomposed into one or more smaller values, and how can we decompose it? Okay, so let's just, before we, go, before we go into that, let's just see this composition happening. Okay, so I have a line with object property, and I'm now calling the constructor here and see how my complicated my constructor is. I'm missing a right paren, I guess. I do that a lot. Uh, so I composed, I composed two ints into a Cartesian point, and I took the Cartesian point and two other ints and composed. No, I guess I'm not missing. Where am I? I oh, am. Yeah. Uh, I composed uh, these two values into another one. Okay? So you see really through the constructor this whole composition process. Okay? And that you're going to be doing a lot of. I mean, you know, just defining objects on their own is not very interesting. You're really doing object oriented programming when you're composing objects. Okay? That's, 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 that's why we create objects so that we can compose them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing that much of overall programming. Okay? There are many reasons to create objects, but that's the primary reason. Okay? So the composition is illustrated here. And now if I just say a line with object property, I don't go and put any values. What, am, am I doing any composition? And if so, what kind? So what's going to happen here? If I just say a new a line with object property, what values will my width and height primitive variables have? Zero. What value will my location have? No, not a valid value. Okay? Which is either good news or bad news. It's good news because you'll get a null pointer exception. Sorry, it's bad news. Well, it's bad news because you'll get a null pointer exception. It's good news because you'll get an exception for something you did wrong. Okay? It's, it's worse when silently your program fails rather than, you know, announcing this is where, you know, you did wrong. At least you know what to fix. Okay? So initialize to zeros, initialize to null. Okay, and that's 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 exactly when we go and say, look, this is an object type, this is primitive type, type, and object types have null values associated with them. Okay, that's a big deal. You'll get these exceptions, and you see that while you're programming. Okay. So I can go and look at the physical structure of an object, okay, which is my instance variables, location, width, and height, and um, what will the physical, and, and I have not decomposed a Cartesian point into smaller <coughs> values. Do you guys remember what the physical structure of a Cartesian point was? We had a Cartesian point and a polar point. The difference between a Cartesian point and a polar point was, do you guys remember? The properties were the same, yeah. Uh, which, which, uh, stored yeah, and, and the, the two variables, the variables that were stored were the Cartesian coordinates. So we had exact, how many variables did we have? Okay, 
So that's my physical structure. And my and so these so when we draw the physical structure, we so in this structure we have boxes and lines. Okay, the lines happen to be variable names. Okay, and the boxes happen to be type names. So you start with the type name, you go and draw these lines, and each of these lines is a variable in that type. Okay, and if if that type doesn't have any variables, you just stop. It's atomic. If that type has some variables, you decompose a little bit more, and you call, and, and, and then you go and give the variable names and the types. Now, some of you I know have taken some advanced courses, and have you guys seen some technical terms for boxes and lines in somewhere else? Beyond just, you know, CS1 programming, I know some of you guys have done at, in school a little bit more sophisticated programming than this. Yeah. Classes and subclasses you also use lines for, right? Yeah, we, we, we use lines for all kinds of things. It gets very confusing sometimes. In fact, uh, there's a whole methodology, you know, that these kinds of lines with this kind of arrows mean inheritance. This kind of thing means, you know, structure, okay? Uh, so, yes, we use lines all over. But generally, when we draw diagrams consisting of boxes and lines, these, these boxes are sometimes called... Uh, how many of you have seen trees? Not many. Okay, good. In a tree, these boxes would be called? Nodes. Okay? And these lines would be called? <coughs> Branches or edges. Okay? So let's go in. If you do, haven't seen trees, now we, we get to sort of... We, if you haven't seen the stuff, let's, let's go and use this example to, to teach you that. You'll study the stuff in great depth in... Uh, for 10 data structures, okay? And, uh, okay, so this is class of primitive type. And this is a node or a vertex. This is an edge, okay? So we have many, we have many kinds of boxes. And, uh, of course, you know, from a programming language point of view, these boxes are types, and these types could be primitive or object or whatever. But in terms of, just a structure. How many edges are coming in? How many edges are going out? Is there a connection between edges, uh, between two nodes? Those of you who have seen trees, or maybe those of you who haven't even seen trees. Let's, let's go and, let's, for those of you who haven't seen trees, what's the difference between this box and the other boxes? This particular box is special. It's different from all the other boxes in some way. There's no edges going into it. And such a node you might call, if you, a base. Good, good. I'm, it's good to know these terms. Base. If you think of trees, root. Okay. And what, what distinguishes this node from all the other nodes? So this one has no incoming edges. This node has no. And we might call this in a colorful way as leaf, okay? This node has both edges coming in and edges going out. I don't know if there's a good term in English for that or not. We'll just be boring and call it an internal node, okay? And the relationship between this node and this node, you might call what? You might call this node what of this node? A child, and so this node would be a parent of this node. And the relationship between this node and this node? This node is a what of this node? If this, it's, an, it's a child of this, and this is a child of this, this node is a grandchild, or in general, it's a descendant. Okay? Which means the root is an ascendant. So root, leaf, composite or internal node, parent. The parent is also a child. Okay. This is an ancestor, descendant, and I guess we've we've got all these terms. So this 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 kind of terminology you'll see a lot of, and I guess for you know for those of you who haven't seen, seen trees before, this is your first exposure to it. Okay, questions? 
Okay, you'll see a lot of stuff with trees in Forte. Okay, and some here also. Okay, that's the physical structure. And we can similarly create a tr uh, uh, nodes and edges for a logical structure. And now the, um, and again, uh, uh, the, okay, so now the edges are what? The edges are labeled by what? There the edges were labeled by instance variable names. Now they're labeled by property names. So our point has four properties rather than two variables. Okay. And of course types, the primitive types label it. And here I didn't use Cartesian point. I used point, which must mean that for an object value, we label the node by not its class, but its interface, if such an interface exists. Okay, because the interface is the one that is being used. The public methods are being used, basically. If the class has no interface, we can just use a class. Okay? But the point is we're going to look at its logical its properties rather than its uh, variables. Okay? So now if I give you an object and I tell you draw its physical structure or its logical structure, you should be able to do it. Okay? So property name, interface class, a primitive type of property value. Okay? Like I said, if you have an interface, use it. Otherwise, just use the class. Okay? If a class implements two interfaces, then again, you know, you'll have to use the class. So you don't always have an interface to describe all of its components, in which case we'll just use the class. Okay? <coughs> Questions? If a class implements two interfaces, there's no one type to describe this whole structure. So we'll then just go and use the class name here. Otherwise, if there is the point, I mean, you can always use a class name. Just be careful to go and find its properties rather than its variables. That's, that's the real point. Okay? Questions? Okay. So structure types are complicated to deal with just because, you know, you just have, you just have, so much composition. Okay. Uh, so I can go and if I really want to see what my logical structure is, given an object, I can draw it. I can go through the class and see it. And if I want to validate whether what I did was right or not, all I have to do is go and say object editor dot edit the object, show the tree view, and the tree view shows you the logical structure, at least visually. It doesn't have the names. It doesn't. Ha um, it uh, it has the property names. It doesn't have the type names. Uh, those you can, those, those, those you can have, you'll, you'll have to supply yourself, okay? But you're see, really seeing the logical structure in object editor. And is there a tool that you can use? I kind of alluded to it, alluded to it a little earlier to uh, show the physical structure. If you want to just, you know, if you've drawn a physical structure in your head, you want to validate that it's the right structure, can you go and use a tool and say, yeah, that's, that's, there it is. A tool that I've been forcing you guys to use. Which is good for you. An assignment to debugger. debugger. And, and what does it show? Okay. Again, you've got a little tree here. Okay. And that tree is your physical structure, not your logical structure. Okay. You see, so you really see that this idea is not, it's got a precise definition. There's a tool. If it's got a precise definition of a tool can follow it. Okay. So the, the debugger follows the physical structure and object editor follows the logical structure. Okay. Questions? Uh, what might I mean by instance-specific structure? Clearly, structure depends on the class of the object, right? The class is what decides what the variables are. The class is what defines what the properties are. And instance-specific might mean? So two different instances could have two different structures. Okay, it's like when you order two cars from the factory, suddenly they you know, we know that this, the, their number of miles they've driven, the, the tires, how much they've worn out changes, right? Once you order it and use it. And this also says that you, even the structure <coughs> might change. And in this example, can you imagine um, why the, uh, how, how, how could an instance of, Align with object property have two, how, how could two different instances have two different structures? So this is one structure. Can you imagine another, another structure? 
uh, for uh, uh, for the same uh, you assign a Cartesian point to the point property rather than polar point. You know, a lot of you guys, when I first introduced interfaces, and I guess I could have done a better job there, you know, were confused as to why we have interfaces. Okay? And remember, I went and made my, made my property, my location property, a point of type interface, not of type class. By doing so, I was saying, I am not going to commit to my location being stored in a Cartesian point or a polar point. <laughs> The user can, when they, when they compose me, they can pass to my constructor either value, I'll accept it, and I will work because I work in terms of interface methods. Okay? That means this polar point could get placed by a Cartesian point, and now I have a different physical structure. Okay? It still has two variables in it, but it has, it's, it's, a, it's a different structure. And can you imagine even a third structure here, for an instance of this property? So the point could be a Cartesian point, it could be a polar point, or its location could be also a, a point, but point has to be ultimately some class. So yeah, when it's just a point and it's not been assigned a value of some class, it, is, it has the value we saw? Now, these are all three physical structures, different physical structures for the same object. Okay? And we are getting this through this power of, you know, with primitive values this doesn't happen. It's only when variables, when, when we have properties that are object types that we run into all these interesting things. Okay? So the structure of, when you have an object with just, physic, just primitive prop, properties, the, all instances have the same structure. Okay? Questions? Get a lot of new theory here. Uh, and by the way, if you, if you display an object with, whose location is null, you know, object editor tries, tries to do something useful and says, okay, I'm assuming that the location is zero. But in general, a lot of programs will actually uh, throw an exception. Okay? Okay, so this is saying, saying, saying linearly uh, something you can read very quickly on a PDF, what we talked about. So we have nodes and edges and, and, and roots and leaves and internal nodes and, and parent-child relationships and ancestor-descendant relationships. Okay, so all these new kinds of terminology, that's, that's very important. That's not part of the language. It's part of, of, of uh, something more abstract, you know, data structures, which could be composed in any kind of language. Okay, this is very language independent. And we can comp decompose things into physical, physically or logically based on whether we use variables or whether we use properties, or whether we use the public methods or the internal variables. And how we draw some conventions that we followed, rules. So I'm giving you guys the rule. And again, we've talked about these rules before. There's, there's no point just going through this. And then, you know, atomic versus structured type. You know, we'll say as long as you have a child, at least a child, then one child, you're, you're, you're structured, otherwise you're not structured, okay? Okay, and uh, again, you know, it's, it's kind of, con it's convenient to have the location be a point. Uh, it's sometimes useful also to be, for the height and weight to be, width, width to be uh, a type, uh, which could be uh, uh, the dimension, okay? But object editor does allow you to go and replace any of these two, um, the x, y coordinates with uh, a point type. Okay, and what's a point type? Any type that follows the point rules we saw earlier. Okay, so it has to have x and y properties and, and, and the annotation that says it's a point. Okay, so you're free to use either one. Uh, personally, if you know, uh, um, object types are sometimes hard to deal with, so initially you might just want to continue using x and y int, int coordinates. You'll get into less trouble. It's only when you get more sophisticated with object-oriented programming that you may you want to use points. Okay. Also, I added this feature later. It's less likely to work properly. I think it does, but uh, I feel more secure about uh, the first feature that we added. Okay. But you can do it, and you, you're welcome to try it out. And similarly, with string and image shapes, you can use x, y coordinates, or you can use locations, which are, which are points. Okay. So in terms of um, just your project or 
programming in general. We have seen that we can draw lines, rectangles, ovals, points, images, shapes. Is that enough to do a project? Are there other kind of shapes you might want in general or in the project? Or in general, forget the project, you know, you might not remember it. What other shapes might you have studied in geometry? A, a sh yeah. Triangle. Is that an important shape in computer science? Why? Sorry? You can make any shape with tri triangle. Okay, all the graphics you see is a composition of triangles. So can we create a triangle using object editor? We can. Based on what I've told you so far, maybe not. But based on what you could do with object editor, could we? How would you describe a triangle? Many ways to do it. What's one way of des describing a triangle? Yeah. Two points. Uh, will that be sufficient? Wouldn't you need three points? Three points, sorry. Three points or three lines. Okay. And if you said it was three lines, could object editor do something with it? It could show those three lines to you. As far as it's concerned, there are three lines. As far as you're concerned, it's a triangle. As long as you go and place the lines in the right positions, it would be fine. So, how would you supply three, three? We know how to go and supply one line to object editor. We say object editor dot edit new a line, a, a, a line. Okay. How how would we supply three lines to object editor? We could of course say object editor to edit line one, edit line two, edit line three, but that will show three lines in three different windows. So, if you were to design object editor, how might you tell it, here are three lines? Somehow it has to do with structure types. Yeah. You can use an array, an array of three lines. Okay, that's a structure type consisting of three elements. Did I do something? This, maybe this voice activated, or maybe I just do too much hand waving. <laughs> okay. Are we going to come back? When in, when in. <laughs> Hi, I've lost my images on the projectors. Sorry? I'm in uh, G202, I guess. It started, it started, the projector started to go up, and then I set center projector, and it stopped going up. It's, it's coming on the preview, it's just not going to the projector. It's not just going to the screen. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you're doing it, but nothing is still happening.
Okay, this is where I meant to resume. I resume somewhere else, who knows where. Okay, so reset. Okay, we are going back to, this is Groundhog's Day here. We are going back to where we started. And let's go and, and really understand things properly now. So I want to do a Cartesian play. Okay, and I kind of already told you the stuff before, but let's derive it again. So we started off that a triangle could be three elements of an array. And I said, look, you could create an object with with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with a bean with these properties. And what are the properties now that you, supposing you weren't doing an array and you want to just show this display, what properties might you have in this particular object? So we've got a line, another line. What is this? Sorry? A string shape? Another string shape? So what properties do we have here? Of what types? Two lines, two string shapes. And what about this? What do you think this is? When we remember BMI calculator, we, we, the object editor would go and display a slot uh, for, for also a, a textual property like this. This is a graphical property. This is a textual property. So we also have an int property of type. Uh, or named axis length, okay? So we have these properties, axis length, int, x-axis line, y-axis line, x-label, y-label. We don't know the names here, but that's, that's what they are. So we have two line properties, two label properties. These two label properties are, I really mean string shape here, okay? Two string shape properties and one int, okay? So this is how I'm going to create my composite shape, okay? And we kind of saw that you know, in those, in those slides there, which were, which were not meant to be seen at this point. So text property and graphics properties. Okay. And we see here the correspondence. So my X axis and my Y axis are shown, being shown because of these properties and the labels are being shown because of those properties. Okay. So this is how I'm creating a composite sh uh, uh, shape by having multiple, uh, multiple children properties. Okay. So questions about this. Okay, the whole idea, composite shape is a composite object. Composite object could be an array, but in this case, it is a, uh, it's a beam. Okay, so when I go and change the axis length, okay, <coughs> notice what happened? Both axes change in size. Okay, and the origin actually, you didn't probably see this, the origin remained at the same point. Okay. So I now have this object where I can show a Cartesian plane. The whole idea is that, look, Java's uh, graphics rules are, are short, say that X and Y, X goes right and Y goes down, we, and, and, and X is, uh, uh, the, the origin is at the upper left corner. That's not what we saw for mathematics. So let's say we want to draw something in a Cartesian plane. So we're drawing a Cartesian plane. So we, we, the origin is somewhere in the middle, and X goes right and Y goes up. Okay? So we want to simulate these. I'm not saying you should be doing this for your project, but I just want to show you how you could create such an object using what we know already. Okay? So I have, um, I have something that's mutable, okay? so that's, that, that, that you can change, and uh, this axis length is something you can change to go and govern this. So based, we're going to look at the code in a few minutes, but based on what I just said, can you look at the algorithm here? So... We, got, we, we have some code that goes and positions things properly, okay? And when I did set axis length, what do you think? What all do you think happened in the code? It changed the axis length, plus it did what else? Repositioned the labels. And so it, it went and changed these two. These two became, this is the independent property. And labels depend on this property, so they change, plus, of course, the lines themselves. And the question is, and I, was, I went further, do we, did we assign new lines, or did we just change the lines? Okay? You can go either way, and I'm going to tell you one way is better than the other, but you could do both things. Okay? And the origin remains the same. So other properties are dependent on the axis length property. And we see the code here. Okay? I have... And origin x and origin y, okay, which is not directly a property, but which is something I keep internally. I have an axis length property, a uh, variable. I have 
two lines here that are storing my x-axis and my y-axis. I have string shapes to show the two labels. Okay? And in the beginning, I'm given just the axis length and the origin. I create these shapes. I do the geometry. And I go and uh, position things properly. Okay? Now, look what I did here. So I created, I put the origin, I, I assigned the origin value. I created a new line, a new and string shape and so forth. I have to pass appropriate values to the constructors. Now, I'm going and saying 2x x axis x as a function. 2x axis y as a function. So these, uh, these functions are doing what? I mean, they are returning, as the name indicates, they go and convert something to the x axis's x value. Some, some, somehow they can uh, compute the x axis's y value, y axis x value, y axis is y value, and they compute it from what value? axis length and origin. Okay? So they just look at the instance variables and convert them. Now I could have put the, put the formula directly here. And I went and put these functions here. Okay, so let's look at programming style for a minute. Functions is better than better than um, um, is better than writing the code, uh, the code directly because Does it make the program easier to understand in some way? Okay, you can go and defer how that competition is done to some other later point. So that's one reason to make things, make it into a function. What's the other reason to make some, a code into a function? Easier to modify. Easier to modify, okay, so you modify in a different place. Another reason? Even when you're first creating it, you know, why might you have, yeah? We may want to call the same code again. And in this example, do we have to call this code again? I have to set the axis when, when the constructor is called and when else do I have to go and reposition my lines? When we set the axis length, okay? So I want to basically go and do it once and not do it multiple times because then I might, I might just do things one place, I might do it right. And I say, oh, I got it, and then forget to change the other place. Okay? So that's why I'm doing this. Okay? But any, any mysteries about this so far, the constructor? Okay? You go and just do some geometry to make sure the lines are positioned at the right place, and you've got lines with two shapes. Okay? Questions? And my get x axis, my get y axis, get x label, get y label, they all do the obvious things. My set axis length is the most interesting function. It goes and assigns the axis length, and then it goes and says set width to, uh, it, it, it uh, sets the width of the x axis and y axis. Okay? There's no competition involved here. So the width of x axis and the height of y axis, sorry. Okay? So a line. One of the lines has, has zero height, one of the lines has zero width. And then it goes and calls this 2x axis x and so forth functions uh, again. Okay, and I guess I must, might have had an x label x also earlier, but, and, and so I'm calling that function also. Okay? You'll be doing a lot of this kind of computation, so it's important to get it right, and it's not the easiest thing in the world, so I'm going to spend some time on, how we, on different ways of doing this also. But you get the basic idea, how we, we do dependent properties and independent properties. This is your independent property, and you have to compute the dependent properties. Okay? And notice that I am not creating a new line each time. I am going and changing the existing line. Okay? I know from previous offerings of this course, many people just create new lines. And I'll show you an example of that code. That's very clean, actually, but it's not, not very efficient. Okay? And now I'm doing all these, comp this, the, these, these functions, which I can just relegate to a different part of, my, of the code and say, yeah, hopefully these work. Okay, and again, I'm not going to get into this, but, you know, hopefully they do, they do work. Okay? okay? This is where I'm computing these functions I use. Okay. So, I went and used the x act, two x axis y to uh, all these functions, both in the constructor and in the, 
in the uh, setter of axis length. So I did some reuse. Can you imagine doing even more reuse? Can you imagine things, you know, if I, can you imagine my program not perhaps working correctly if I change something at one place that is similar to something at another place but not identical? That's not, not calling the same function. So can you, can you imagine more reuse here? Can you imagine, yeah. Just call the set axis length right here. Okay? In which case, I don't have to go and waste time doing these computations here. I can just pass either some garbage values or just go and pass uh, to line uh, um, no arguments if I have such a constructor. And why do you think that's a better way? It's less lines of code in some sense. I just said set axis length. I don't have to do, do all this stuff. But from, from yeah. yeah you don't have to change code at two places. Okay? You don't have to remember that this is, this is what has to, what is the coordinate of the X label. This is what's the coordinate of the Y label. You decide that once and then just say, okay, go position yourself. So position yourself initially and position yourself each time a set method occurs. Okay? And this is something you have to do a lot. When you're moving Arthur or Galahad or somebody else, you are moving all the lines. Okay, and, you're positioned, and you don't want the hand to move separately from another hand and the legs. Okay, so you want them to be all forming a cohesive whole. You, you're making sure that, the, that it's a cohesive object, a, val, a, a shape, when you first create the shape, and you want it to remain connected when it moves. Okay, so you want to call the same function for both. And uh, so we could just, in a Cartesian plane, cons Constructor could instantiate dependent object with null constructors or constructors of wrong values and then sim simply call set axis. And that's what I'm doing here. Now, I don't remember whether my line all, all actually has null constructor or not, or label, or we have a string shape or not, but let's assume we do. Then I just say set axis length and that will do all the computation. Okay? So this is, this is, this is really important from your programming point of view. Okay? Questions? Okay, so now you see the logical structure of this object. Now, now we've created a very sophisticated object. Okay? We've got the x-axis length, we've got the x-axis itself, which can be broken into proper values, and the y-labels also that can be broken into values. Okay? And I can say something like new Cartesian plane, 200, 125, 125, and I, I, I can just show, show the value. Okay? So we see the complete logical structure here. And we see the graphical properties and the logical structure without graphical properties. So we have three windows here. This is the kind of window we, that was used to display a BMI spreadsheet. We call it a textual window. It shows these, these fields for each property. This is the graphics window which shows all the graphics properties. Okay? You have one graphics window for all of the graphics properties. And this is the tree window and it shows only the graphical properties. And this is the tree window that shows the complete logical structure. Okay. Uh, here's another way to do things. Okay. So my code has become even, 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 uh, even cleaner in some sense. I assign x uh, to axis length. Uh, appropriate value, origin x is appropriate value, origin value, appropriate value. I don't go and create those lines or labels. And where am I creating those lines and labels? My get axis says, each time get ax x axis is called, I'm saying create a line with these values. Each time get y axis is called, I'm creating a new line and so forth. The code is actually quite clean. Right? It's, it's a much smaller piece of code. And I'm calling it inefficient Cartesian plane because so in one case, I created the lines in the beginning in the constructor and my set axis length went and changed those lines and shapes. Now what I'm doing is every time I call a get method, I go and 
return a new line with the appropriate coordinates. Yeah. You're creating a lot of objects. Every time you create an object, what happens in memory? You have to find some space for it and put it there and, and, and it's, it's costly. Okay? And if you're doing a lot of refreshes, each refresh means new line. Okay? So you will be tempted, especially those of you who like to program cleanly, to say, oh, this is so clean. Okay, I don't have to go and, this is, remember we said between get BMI spreadsheet, between a BMI spreadsheet and a, another BMI spreadsheet, that one of them computed the BMI each time, but that was a little computation, that's not pretty, pretty, pretty efficient. Whereas the other one stored the BMI value in a variable and just returned the value each time the getter was called. So the, the dependent properties were not computed each time. And yeah, when they're primitive, it's okay, but when they're object properties, that means you're allocating a new object in memory that's expensive. So please, please don't do that. Okay, even though you may be tempted to do so. Okay, so you're just seeing that I can, when I'm getting into these composite objects, there are many, many ways to go and program the same thing. And now you really get into, you know, efficiency issues, uh, reuse issues, and so forth. And you're seeing them in this example. Okay, any questions on this one? Okay, the set axis length is so, so simple. I just said axis length equals set axis length. So it's, 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 it's in many, arguably, pretty clean code. Okay. Okay, we have two minutes. Um, and we'll start from here again next time. But just tell me what the properties of this particular object might be. I've created, I've created, a, sh I've created a shuttle image inside a Cartesian plane. And I'm going to make the shuttle move based on the x and y, shuttle x and shuttle y I'm seeing here. Okay? And anybody quickly want to say what the properties might be? Just think for a minute. Okay? Well, I'll let you guys just think, okay? And we'll just continue from here from next time.
Okay, so let's restart. So basically, um, as was pointed out, uh, what you see as smooth graphics is really got underneath a bunch of triangles composed. Okay? And we've seen that if we can somehow create a triangle using object editor, then we could create any shape using object editor. Now, I'm not going to say we're going to do that, compose triangles. Uh, for that, you have to take a graphics course. But in theory, you could do it. And what we could do, though, is allow lines to be composed into bigger objects like triangles or Cartesian plane, shuttle. You know, we'll go and see some examples here. And in the case of triangles, we saw that a triangle would be consist of three lines. And how do we tell object editor that here is three lines that are one unit? Well, we give it a composite type. We give it a structure type whose uh, logical structure consists of three components that happen to be lines. In the case of an array, its logical structure is actually three, is the elements. But if we were to create our own bean, we could create a bean with three, uh, we could create a triangle bean with three properties, each of which is a triangle, a line, and we could show it. Show it a triangle. Okay. So uh, that's the key behind, the, behind what this what, what object editor design and the design of program we will, we will have. That a composite object is object with one or more object logical components. Thing non-composite object is zero or more. And uh, what we're going to say is a composite shape is an object with one or more shape components. So a composite shape is a composite object where at least one of the properties happens to be a shape object. Okay. So I'm going to give you practice in dealing with composite objects by making you essentially create a lot of composite shapes. Okay? And, and, and those will be visually uh, uh, visible to you, so it's easier to debug something that's visually visible rather than something inside the program only. An atomic shape is that shape that cannot be decomposed into component shapes. Okay? So we've seen atomic, atomic shapes, we've seen composite objects, we know enough theory now to create a composite shape. Okay? So, and, and, and just to point out the difference, you can have an atomic shape be a composite object, okay? So, this object is composite, it's got a location property, okay? But it's a composite, so you, if you look at it in the tree view, you see that there's a structure there, okay? But as a shape, you can't decompose that into smaller shapes, okay? So, as a shape, it is an uh, atomic shape. Okay, so I'm just trying to show you the relationship between, between these terms. A lot of terms we've learned today. Okay, a lot of good quiz questions. <laughs> uh, now we're going to come up with a composite shape that is also a composite object. And we see here a line, which is a composite, which is, which is, uh, which we see here a Cartesian plane. Okay, and it's two lines, not a triangle, but with three lines, two li li lines. And we see here an x-axis property and a y-axis property. And if I go and say object editor edit some instance of a Cartesian plane, and if the lines have been initialized to, to, to line values um, and not to null values, then you will get two lines on the display. And it so happens that these lines happen to be displayed and formatted in a certain way just because of the geometry we implemented into Cartesian plane. Okay? So based on this, what are the properties here? Uh, so we have, uh, okay, I guess I'm, 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 I'm saying here that, look, my location is mutable, okay? So our point, in the case of point, our, our, our property was not mutable. Here I'm saying it's mutable, and let me just see where I'm going here. Um, but I don't have any mutable property here. Okay, so that's what I'm saying here. That you can you can define you can allow these these properties to be mutable or not, to have setters or not, and that's up to you. Uh, but in, in this in the case of this particular composite shape, um, we have uh, only getters and no setters and that, that'll work fine because each of these the line itself is mutable. The line can be dis you can't assign a new line to the uh, class to the object, but you can change the line itself. Okay, so that's the point I'm going to make, I guess. Okay, that if you don't have a mutable point, that means if you have a location property, you have to go and assign a new point when you want to change the location. Okay? And uh, similarly, you could do that with a line. 
that if you have a triangle with three lines, you could make the, the each line property a, a, a mutable one or not mutable. If it's mutable, you can assign new lines. If it's not mutable, then maybe you can change the line properties themselves. Okay, so that's, I guess, what I'm saying here. And typically, composite shapes don't have setters. Okay, that's the other thing I want to make. Because, if I, because, you know, a triangle, there will always be three lines. The question is, where are those lines displayed? So to move the line, you shouldn't have to go and assign a new line to that object. You can just change the line. Okay? So this is where sort of programming with structure types becomes tricky, because sometimes you can change the value of a descendant, or sometimes you can just assign a new descendant to yourself. So... Okay. Okay. So the object editor graphics rules now are, 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 we are we are getting into those here, and we see here that if I go and display uh, <coughs> display something with so you know, this is this is not quite what I expected these slides to be. I might have might have uh, might have might have changed it another deck. Okay, let's do with these. So. Uh, I've got a new type now, shuttle location, which is, uh, you know, let me just, let me.
Okay.
Okay, let's understand composition. So this is something I can create using object editor, as you see I have. How do you think I created it? What kind of properties do I have here? Sorry, a little louder. So you've got one line, another line, X label, Y label. I've got one other property that's very familiar to you also, right? Yeah, what is what and that's also a property. Axis length. Okay? That's a familiar property. You don't, you don't, now you've not so much into your DNA, you don't even look at, see it, right? So these are my properties. This is the good old property that's, that's displayed in the main window. That's the same window that you've been showing so far. This is a separate window that comes up if you have any graphics object. So this is a text property, and then you have graphics properties. You have the x-axis, you have the y-axis, you have the x-label, you have the y-label. Okay? So you see now composition. And this code shows you it can be done. And this code shows you it can be done. Okay, so we can see a Cartesian plane's logical structure. Now you see why logical structure was important. You can create, you can go berserk with very large logical structures. And that's exactly what you'll be doing in your project. Okay, you'll be creating a very, very complex logical structure. Okay? And now I have three windows here. And can you guys give me the rules? I've kind of hinted at them, but to say more explicitly what the rules are for um, showing, uh, you know, what goes in each window. So we'll call this the tree window. We'll call this the graphics window. We'll call that the main. Window. Okay, that's the window that you the object editor normally comes up. So you see in the tree window. the complete logical structure. You see in the graphics window, dependent properties, but we, when we had, but when we had a BMI spreadsheet, the BMI was a dependent property. It was not shown in the graphics window, it was shown in the main window, right? So you will see in the graphics window those types that those types of object that are recognized as having graphics from, which we can just call graphical types. Okay, and, the, and you know what they are. Okay, point, line, rectangle, and, and so on. Okay, anything else that's left is your text problem. Okay, let's understand composition. So this is something I can create using object editor, as you see I have. How do you think I created it? What kind of properties do I have here? Sorry, a little louder. So you've got one line, another line, X label, Y label. I've got one other property that's very familiar to you also, right? Yeah, what is what and that's also a property. Axis length. Okay? That's a familiar property. You don't, you don't, now you've not so much into your DNA, you don't even look at, see it, right? So these are my properties. This is the good old property that's, that's displayed in the main window. That's the same window that you've been showing so far. This is a separate window that comes up if you have any graphics object. So this is a text property, and then you have graphics properties. You have the x-axis, you have the y-axis, you have the x-label, you have the y-label. Okay? So you see now composition. Okay, and now what, what did I do? I changed the axis length from 200 to 300, and I kept the same center. My lines expanded, my labels moved. Now it's, that's because they are just dependent properties on the axis length. Okay, you know how to do dependent, simple dependencies, now you'll do much more complex dependencies. Okay, that's how you'll make your objects move. That's how I made my avatar move in the project. Okay, I changed this x and y coordinates, so and, and then everything else was a function of that, so it also changed. Okay. So, Cartesian plane retains the same origin, 
and other properties depend on the axis length property. Okay? So you can understand that this can be done. And this code shows you it can be done. Okay? And this code shows you it can be done. Okay? And this code shows you it can be done. Okay? I'm going to. But you can look at it. And there's one I'm going to. But you can look at it. And there's one sort of point I want to make at this here. So you can see that the X label had to move its position. The Y label had to move its position. In both of these labels, the, look, uh, the, the position was a, a point. It was not X and Y. Okay, and a point is an immutable object. So when I went and set its location, I, I had to go and assign to it a new point. Okay, which makes sense, right? The location has gone from one point to another point. I can't change the point itself, just like you can't change the number five itself. You've got a variable that's holding that number, you go and assign to that variable a new number. Okay, now we are talking of an object, so you have to go and do a new Cartesian point. So, uh, this makes it a little bit convoluted to use point as location, that's why I personally prefer to use X and Y as, as coordinates, but a lot of students like to use point, and they feel more comfortable doing that, because you can just send one point in a method, you don't have to send an X and Y both in a method, uh, if it meets the point. Okay, so this is something you need to sort of understand that, Points are immutable, and when you want to change the location of an object that has an immutable point as its type, just make that point, just make that refer to another instance of another point. Okay, you, this is a little less efficient, you're creating all these objects in fly, on the fly, but uh, there's always this trade-off between efficiency <coughs> and programmability. Okay, again, I'm not going through the code, it's just geometry, and, and it's just there for you to see what, run it on your own if you want to. And if there are some details that, that you want to see in it, they're there for you. Okay. And another way to look at types is to, to, to decompose types into structured types and atomic types. Okay. So values of atomic types, like atoms, can't be divided. And values of structured types can be divided. Okay, so uh, now, and I've got an example here to show how you might divide uh, a value of a structure type. Okay. So what we have is uh, a point, and oh, sorry, it's a line. I guess. Okay. It's a line with height, width, and a point holding the location of the upper left corner of the line. And I have a division here of the, that object into components. So, based on this, you know, the intuitive idea of, you know, atomic versus non-atomic objects in general, in physical and in the computer world, and this, in this picture, can you define for me what a structure type is? More precisely than what I just did. I mean, or to put it another way, how, how am I dividing? What, what is the criteria I'm using to make these arrows, Marie? I'm dividing it by its properties. Okay, so I'm saying oh, an object has properties. So a structured object would be an object with more than one property or more than zero properties. I can't make up my mind. What do you guys think? Okay. So so we just going to in my in the definition I have, it's got uh, more than zero properties. Okay. Uh, it could have one, but and it's, it's just as valid to go and say it's more than one. So um, that's one way to divide an object into components. And now that you understand beams and properties, you know, you're well versed to go and do this division. Um, is there another way to divide an object into components, which you might have known before you uh, heard about properties? <coughs> Divided by instance variables? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, take it back. Okay. So, so that's, I, I told you that an object has a logical representation defined by its interface and a physical representation defined by its instance variables. So I could use the logical 
representation to find its logical components or its logical structure. And if that logical structure has one or more components, we'll call it structured, logically structured. Okay. Okay, so we can see a Cartesian plane's logical structure. Now you see why logical structure was important. You can create, you can go berserk with very large logical structures. And that's exactly what you'll be doing in your project. Okay, you'll be creating a very, very complex logical structure. Okay? And now I have three windows here. And can you guys give me the rules? I've kind of hinted at them, but to say more explicitly what the rules are for um, showing, uh, you know, what goes in each window. So we'll call this the tree window. We'll call this the graphics window. We'll call that the main window. Okay, that's the window that you the object editor normally comes up. So you see in the tree window the complete logical structure. You see in the graphics window dependent properties. But we, when we had, but when we had a BMI spreadsheet, the BMI was a dependent property. It was not shown in the graphics window. It was shown in the main window, right? So you will see in the graphics window those types that those types that object that recognizes having graphics from, which we just call graphical types. Okay, and, the, and you know what they are. Okay, point, line, rectangle, and, and so on. Okay, anything else that's left is your text box.